Let's begin. Here in Atlantic Canada, we've been fortunate for many years to rely on our natural resources and our close proximity to our largest trading partner, the United States. Growing access to international markets over the last few years is highlighting more than ever the need for businesses in our region to be globally competitive, not just with competitors around the world, but also here at home. Global competitiveness requires the technology and skills to meet the demand. So let me start this first question with you, David. As an economist, you've worked on economic development issues across Atlantic Canada. What do you see as the most relevant issues preventing Atlantic businesses from adopting new productivity technologies? So I think it's a complicated question with complicated answers. I think number one, um, governments in the region, because historically we've had a perceived surplus of labor, have incentivized job creation. So this has been the mantra of governments in all four Atlantic provinces for decades. And so that convinced companies to build labor intensive business models, particularly our exporters. So the business model was lots of cheap labor uh, rather than investing in capital and equipment for productivity enhancement. And I think there's a hangover for that. We're still seeing that today. A lot of government programs even today incentivize if you hire more workers, we give you more money, uh, and therefore there's an incentive again to hire uh, workers rather than look at, at productivity enhancement. So I think there's a cultural hangover from our history, and now that we're having real shortages of labor, uh, uh, we really have to shift that thinking toward investing in, in productivity, but also investing in attracting uh, and retaining uh, uh, folks from outside. And I think another issue uh, related to that is uncertainty over the future. So if you're gonna make significant investments in capital uh, or processes that make you more productive, you have to amortize that over five years, 10 years, in some cases even, even more than that. And so with, with sort of an uncertain future, a lot of businesses are saying, well, I'll just sort of harvest what I've got now and I won't make those investments in productivity. So we do have to have a longer term view. We have to encourage our particularly smaller, medium sized uh, businesses to have a longer term view uh, and invest in productivity for the future. And I know groups like ACOA and other economic development agencies are shifting more towards support on the, on the productivity front. And then the third thing I think is just scale. So you have a lot of very small firms. When we talk SME in Atlantic Canada, we're really talking 50 employees and mm -hmm. under. Yeah. Whereas in North America, you're talking 500 employees and under when you talk about SMEs or small and medium sized enterprises. Uh, so I think those really small firms have a lot of specific challenges related to how you become more productive. I'll give you a quick example, the craft brew industry. So everybody likes craft brew, right? The, 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 the IPA and the, the, the sort of craft brew. Well, in New Brunswick, when we just had the two big producers, Molson uh, and uh, Moosehead, we had the product, most productive brew sector in the country, generating something like $200 plus worth of value add for every hour of labor. Then we had all this, this influx of small, tiny producers, and now we have a, a, a productivity per hour of about 50. So would anybody want to get rid of that sector? Absolutely not. We love the, brew, the brewery sector, the craft brew sector, the small brewers. But it did drag down productivity because those small firms cannot achieve the, the productivity that you can get from the scale of the large plant. So I'd like to see more tie-ups. I'd like to see more companies merging, uh, acquiring other firms and building scale and then using that as a platform for productivity. Great, so I know that my team and I have been working a lot with our clients uh, to drive productivity and innovation, uh, to work with them and to see the benefit of doing that. And I know one of those companies is Pratt & Whitney. Uh, I had to go to estimates the day that it happened, so I didn't get to have the tour that my team came back regaling about what they saw, Karen Ann, when they went to your facility and really saw, really side by side, uh, the old and the new. So share with us, what is Pratt & Whitney doing and how are you guys driving productivity and innovation and technological adoption? Okay, thank you. Um, Pratt & Whitney Canada, um, I think as most of you know, manufactures aircraft engines. So every minute of the day, um, somewhere in the world, uh, an aircraft is taking off with a Pratt & Whitney Canada engine. In Halifax, we um, are a small 350 um, size plant uh, that ma manufactures three different production lines. Um, we have gone, in the, we've been in business about 30 years, and we've gone through a lot of transformation in the last six years. 
So we've had a capital investment of over 60 million actually in the last six years. And where we saw the need for that was over the 30 years, yes, we automated 30 years ago, so we've had a culture of technology, but we are competing worldwide uh, against other suppliers to make these aircraft parts. So we needed to make a step change because we had a lot of lines that were being actually outsourced to China and Poland. And in order to compete with those markets, we knew we had to automate. So what we did, we um, bid on these products that we knew we could be competitive against if we automated them. So our employees, 10 years, about between 25 and 30 years. We have an extremely low turnover, less than 1%. So we knew we had a big task in retraining our employees as well. So when we looked at uh, what we had to do, we partnered with the community college here to look at what, um, what had to be done, but also we looked at our OEMs to do the retraining of our employees. Uh, it's, uh, we mandated actually one of our biggest automation suppliers to hire someone locally for 18 months that had the right skill set to train our employees. So they were in our plant to train our employees for 18 months, which really was uh, um, invaluable. But at our plant, the culture is technology, and the shop floor employees ask for automation. They see it as a benefit. They see it as um, new work, new jobs, instead of being afraid of it. And that's really our foundation. Innovation and technology is the foundation. Another thing that we're doing, we see in the next 10 years, we're gonna have a huge retirement. Right now, we have, um, so as I said, we're with 350 people. We have 20 students. And those students range from engineers, technologists, machinists in our plant, because we see that coming up as a skill set that's missing. And uh, we have to go out and, and uh, partner with the colleges and universities. And because we're part of a huge corporation too, we do have research chairs at Dow, UBC, McGill to make sure that we do um, stay current in our innovation. So how do you think you create that culture of openness? to change and innovation? I think being transparent with our employees and they see, you, they see lines moving out, but they also see lines moving in that have the automation and have that and that we offer the retraining of them as well. Well, that's great. So that's a, an urban manufacturing perspective. And now uh, turn to you, Zita. Uh, when you talk about productivity, innovation, uh, retraining labor force shortage or, or, or too many in the in the labor force give us a perspective um, uh, from Fogo Island from uh, Newfoundland and Labrador from perhaps a more rural context of are the issues the same or different and what are the lessons that we need to learn to bring into our rural and regional communities I think the issues are the same the, the scale is different uh, I mean I must say I never really understood what people mean by productivity and of course, I get deeply suspicious of it because then I wonder, where do the gains accrue? I mean, we've gone through incredible productivity gains in lots of industries, and the underlying communities and people that are engaged in it are just worse off every time. So I think we need to be suspicious of that as a goal in and of itself. I think it depends on what you're trying to do. And I think we sometimes conflate innovation and technology, and they're, they're related, but they're not the same, and certainly, Rural communities are deeply innovative places, even though for the scale of things that we're doing, we don't need a lot of automation. And I do very much agree with your point. We actually have a labor shortage. We need more people, that is for sure. But I think for whether you're thinking about technology and you're thinking about innovation more broadly, you've got to start with what is it we're trying to do? And in Atlantic Canada, and Newfoundland in particular, Newfoundland and Labrador, even more so, we're not so many people, so we gotta get really good at doing things at a small scale that fetch a high price. We cannot compete with China to be making whatever, and nor should we. I mean, this was my experience from being in the fiber optics industry at JDS Uniphase. We were really good at making very expensive things in very small quantities. Anything else would have been a death wish. So I think for Atlantic Canada, we just need to understand that nature knows everything. Atlantic Canadians probably have deeper, and rural Canadians in particular, deeper embeddedness in nature, which has all of the innovative answers if we pay attention. The world is questing for more nature, more authentic, whatever that means to people, the different things. 
I think we have all these building blocks. I, I think if you take the Fogo Island in, when we were first starting, of course, there was a big lineup of people who said, oh, you have to start doing you know, online advertising and all of this, which I don't believe in. I mean, my dream is we will take down the website for the Fogo Island Inn. And the people who were involved in creating that inn are deeply innovative people who have adapted, most of them worked at the fish plant before or something, who have adapted to new careers. And I don't think they're frightened of innovation. I think the conversation is if we're going to automate everything and people are just going to make online bookings, that's a frightening conversation. And why would we do that anyway? Because that actually takes away the value we can offer, which is if you have a conversation with Elaine Penton on the phone, you will never forget it. And so I think we just need to be careful of wrong-mindedness, especially at the smaller scale. I think you're, you're so right. Uh, one of the things that I noticed when I moved to Atlantic Canada six years ago was the, from Toronto, was the pace and talking to people. And I wondered at one point, do you have to tip the Purolator and FedEx guys that come to your door because they stay and talk to you for such a long exactly. time? And I wondered why they were standing on my step. Because in Toronto, they'd barely throw you the package and slam exactly. the door on you. And buying milk on Fogo Island, I have to tell you, you will not feel when you go in to buy milk that you're being particularly productive because it takes an hour <laughs> to get out of the store. But that is highly productive because that's the thing we have to figure out how to do in the rest of the world. So I, th I think we should be careful not to be going about this in the wrong way. Great, good perspective. Uh, so Paul, you've heard some different, uh, different perspectives here. Uh, you know, I know that um, we are seeing companies uh, drive innovation, and I agree with Zita, there's different, I mean, innovation is not only technology, it's just a, a new way of doing something that we've done in a better way. Um, and so you have to not make it be a scary proposition, and everybody uh, has that ability. But, but give us a sense of, um, you know, companies on, of all sizes uh, ha faced with the challenge of training and retooling their workforce. I mean, what are, how do they do that? And what is the perspective that ISAD brings to that conversation in terms of supporting that important initiative? Well, first I would say that we start from a position of strength as a country. We have one of the most educated workforces in the OECD, uh, so it's a, a great starting point, but that's not to say we have all the skills we need for the future, so some huge challenges at, at the same time. Um, we work closely with the OECD, and they say that maybe 10 to 15% of jobs are, are like seriously at risk, but that over half the jobs are gonna be deeply impacted by technology, so this is what we need to really get, uh, get ready for. Uh, three areas of policy focus that I would, I guess, highlight. One is the pipeline of new skills into the, into the workforce. Lots of traction on work integrated learning. Uh, the federal government's made some pretty significant investments in this space now, totaling over a billion dollars actually when you put uh, the last few budgets together working with employers to, to make sure that pipeline of new talent into the workforce is aligned with, with the needs that we have. Um, secondary, the reality is that the workforce we're gonna have in the next few years is actually the workforce that we have now. So it's, a lot of it is about upskilling the, the existing workers and that's where I think we're less advanced. We need to, to think about some new models, uh, create a marketplace for, for upskilling the workforce where we can think about organizing the demand side better with employers, including SMEs who may not otherwise be able to, to access that, that marketplace, but also have institutional responses with, with new, new types of training some interesting collaborations emerging on that front, including some investments in a new future skills center that the federal government supported, but, but other areas where we trying to, we want to be a catalyst, I guess, to create that, that marketplace of business to, and, and institutions to, to do the upskilling. And lastly, the, the talent that we can't build, we have to get. So it's about attracting global, global talent, and I think there's more areas to be leveraged there. Some flexibilities with um, this new global talent stream that, that has huge leverage. Uh, for every uh, foreign national that comes in through that program, there's many, many Canadians that get jobs out of it, so it's a, it's a key driver uh, of, of the economy. Um, but also foreign students are another huge source of, of labor. So uh, many dimensions of, of that pipeline of talent, the existing workforce, and then how we, how we bring in uh, talent from abroad to our three of the main policy thrusts. That I would, so do you think there's uh, anything particular in Atlantic Canada with our demographics, with the rurality or regional nature of our economy that are particular. I know with some of our clients, what I've observed with them is as we work on productivity enhancements and improvements, yeah. 
it has just simply allowed them to do more because they're able to take their same workforce. They're not losing any of the workforce. They're redeploying. Yeah, it's, it's, it, you're, you're complementing the technological exactly. change by adding value elsewhere. And it's, it's strategies like we just heard at Pratt & Whitney where you can think about how you transition your workforce and add value in, in different ways, taking advantage of the technology. And I think we've got a, an added challenge with, with, with SMEs, how they can come together to do that. We've got some a lot of attention from a policy perspective on the ocean supercluster right now, trying to draw in, in some SMEs there uh, as well. Tourism is another area where there's a lot of, lot of activity in both urban and, and rural as well. So a couple of areas where we think there's uh, some good opportunities and some for technology adoption and, and skills upgrading. Great. So those in the audience that are here, you can start thinking about your questions because we are going to save time to take some questions from the audience. And maybe we'll move to some uh, shorter answers, but everybody can participate in them. Um, I'm just going to turn to you, David, uh, in terms of you started off and now you've listened to three mm. folks talk, yeah. and I don't know if you're chomping at the bit to bit. say something else. So I'm going to let you do that. So I'm not Darth Vader when it comes to productivity. I was beginning to wonder. No, no. Uh, there, it's really about competitiveness. It's not about necessarily productivity, but there are a lot of industries that, that could use a capital but, and, and become more productive. But in general, it's about competitiveness. So if you can be competitive, uh, you can, you know, you, it doesn't matter really with the cost side of things. So, right, so and you, and, and which I'm sure you would agree, you'll be more competitive if you focus on your relative strengths that absolutely. nobody else can play in. Absolutely. And I'm actually advocating for uh, an entrepreneurial renaissance in rural Atlantic Canada. And you're kind of at that's, the vanguard of that. Yes, that's But I think there's real potential. About. But the question is where are those entrepreneurs going to come from? I and think a lot of them are here. Because you still need to have that risk profile. You still need to have that sort of ability to, to go out on a limb, right? It's, it's not I think, that you know, I think it doesn't even start there. I think innovation, I think it starts with seeing. I think people are half blind because we're reading too many of these idiotic business books that talk about entrepreneurs being risk takers and they get up in the morning and they're going to put things at risk. I think that the rural people I know are all deeply innovative. And as soon as you help them focus on what is called asset-based community development. What do we have? Yeah. Surely we have something. What do we know? What do we miss in some cases and what can we do about it? That leads you to a whole bunch of delicious opportunities. Yeah. And then I think we have to build the, help them build the business skills and understand that you don't have to have a Hugo Boss suit to be a business person. So I think we got to re rejig the way we do business a little bit. Right, and we're not going to corner the conversation here, but I would say that that, it's dangerous that conversation is not being had in rural communities in Atlantic Canada the way it should be. I agree with you completely. Yeah. Good. That we found something to agree okay. on. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, that's fantastic. So are there sectors in particular, and, and Paul, you mentioned ocean, um, that Atlantic Canada is best positioned to lead if technological adoption um, innovation is driven um, and you know maybe you want to expand a bit more on that and then I'll come to you Karen Ann because I think you might have a perspective from your sector. Well I think two things are, are new with the, the super cluster approach one is the, the nature of the partnerships bringing together people that previously really didn't have relationships because of competition and bringing them around the same table drawing in uh, SMEs at the same time uh, another is thinking about not only the verticals of the ocean sector that have maybe done some work together, but thinking about the, the commonality and some, some um, comparative advantage that we have as a nation by bringing those verticals together. I think there's a lot of sense of, there's huge ambition and potential uh, in terms of uh, economic development and, and value added that has been estimated out of, out of bringing that economy uh, to fruition. So sure. that's a big area. And the other one I mentioned was tourism where there's I, again, lots of research done on the, the untapped potential there that, uh, that is both urban, rural, and, and year-round in Canada. Great. Karen Ann, from your perspective, sectors? Uh, obviously, manufacturing and aerospace are ones, but uh, manufacturing in particular for smaller organizations, it's, uh, it does seem tough because the capital investments are, are harder to get. But um, it's an area I think that we haven't put a lot of focus on in, in Atlanta, Canada's manufacturing. And I think that we can be competitive worldwide. And I agree with Zita, if you make um, something, we all, all of our low complexity parts were outsourced. We only make very high complex parts in our plant. And that was a step change for us over the last 10 years. And I think that's what you have to think about when you're trying to expand and, and do that. 
You know, I really I agree with you. I think one of the privileges in my role is to be able to get inside the doors mm -hmm. of a Pratt & Whitney, of companies right across the province who are making really neat things and, and tell those stories. And it's, it is not common knowledge about how much is made here. Um, in you know, telling the story of the 3,600 people that work for Michelin, people often say, Michelin Tire, they're there? You know, how does, so that's an example of long-rooted history of, of making things and manufacturing things. We want to tell that story so much that we actually work with Maritime Made TV show to tell the stories of what's happening here uh, in, in, the, in the Maritimes. So, Zita, how can businesses learn from each other? We know there's success stories out there. We probably don't talk enough about them. Sure I don't. think that's a big part of it. But yeah. so how can they learn from each other? Absolutely. So you're going to come over and see what we're doing. Uh, uh, exactly. And I think that we can um, look at the ones that have achieved global reach for local initiatives. So that's, I think that is the most important thing. We cannot make a future by figuring out what is it we have that goes through the front door and then out the back door of Amazon. I mean, I, I think the whole digital platform will never favor us as small places. I thank heavens for companies like Shopify that are actually building an alternative model. And I think whether it's government programs or economic studies and modeling, focusing on global reach for local initiatives is key. And what do we need to do to do that? I mean, the Fogo Island Inn or the Fogo Island furniture business is an example of that. You know, the post office was in a bit of a flack last week in, in Joe Bat's arm because they couldn't figure out how to get something to Slovenia because they didn't think it, they didn't realize it was different than Slovakia. <laughs> how on earth does that happen? Why does someone in Slovenia feel they need a chair from Fogo Island? Because that chair carries place. And we have to export culture. We have to export place. We have to export small. I'm talking about small communities. I think it, it, you, Karen, and I have to keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely right thinking, I think. Um, we need to wrestle with the digital world in a way that favors all places, big and small. And I know we've stated we have a public policy now around internet for all places. We, we need to hurry up on that bit. And we can't even begin. We shouldn't even be using any words that start with T, let alone say tourism, until people can figure out how to get there. You know, these are like fundamental building blocks that uh, if we really mean it, you'd say, let's take a 100-year time horizon. Let's think about communities as going concerns. And then we have to figure out what is it we have to do to enable them. I don't think it's that hard. I didn't just think we kind of have to do it. And it might cost a bit of money, but if you're investing for 100 years, people say to me, why would anyone in their right mind spend $41 million on an inn on Fogo Island where there's only 2,500 people? So well, the last time I checked, Fogo Island was part of Newfoundland and Labrador. And I think that's still part of Canada. I have an election tomorrow. Um, <laughs> You'll see. And, and so I don't see what we do in terms of adding value. I mean, we add $30 million to that local economy from that thing. So if I'm measuring over 100 years and I don't measure that 20, our 2,500 souls can help lots of people. Yeah. Yep. And Brand Canada is strong. I mean, the Very Canadian strong. brand is strong and different platforms. You mentioned Shopify. We've been working here in Halifax with eBay, uh, getting a number of companies. Globally, we've worked with AliExpress. It does provide an avenue for smaller companies to find markets globally. And you just need to make sure that they're protected and that we know what's happening. So, OK, questions from the audience. I don't know how we're doing this. OK, Charlie's running with the microphone. He's got it up. Anybody has a question that they would like to ask? They got to put their hand up. Okay, while you think, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, technology adoption and having people have the right skills. You made that connection, Karen Ann, about you had to have your workforce ready to adopt technology. Uh, so is it a chicken and egg? Which, I mean, do you train the workforce? Do you adopt the technology first? How do you do that in terms of making sure that you'll have a successful outcome uh, when you spend those resources doing either of those things? Mm -hmm. I think we've actually been, um, if you build it, they will come kind of model on terms of uh, the employees uh, adopting the technology. So we have, um, we've definitely, we, we, but as again, we had a culture of people that wanted the technology to come. Um, 
But I think that's the kind of model that I, th I think you have to go there first before you retrain your employees. Paul, anything well, on that? Well, from a public policy perspective, it's obviously hugely preferable to have a company think the long game and retrain their workforce than to get rid of their workforce and get another one and, and leave the, the public sector with, with the dislocation side of that. So uh, I think it is a, ch uh, a challenge of how we engage the business community and other partners to, to do more of this internalizing of the, the, the retraining and the upskilling and avoiding the, the human cost and the financial cost of the, of the dislocation that otherwise would happen. Great, I know that there's questions out there. I know you guys all didn't come here to just sit and listen to us. Yes, Louis. I was just going to ask, have we made progress in the last 10 years and how and where would we fit on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a scale? Progress in what way? Progress on productivity? Not much. Not well. Using statistics. Watch <laughs> out! <laughs> we might be in trouble up here. Uh, not much. No. no. I mean, you have the problem. One of the problems with productivity is we sometimes we're comparing apples and oranges, and that that's not even a question of how you define productivity. Or where, where to gain. But we'll compare capital-intensive Alberta to service-intensive PEI and say why is PEI so unproductive compared to Alberta? So I think you do have to compare apples to apples. Uh, and that's one of our problems. But just in general, if you look at the productivity numbers, they're not getting that much better in Atlantic Canada. Technology. Well, again, it depends on the industry. Uh, there's lots of ways to become more productive. Like I said, the brewing sector, the brew brewing sector actually got more unproductive by those standard measures, but everybody likes craft brew, so. So that's not a loss, that's a gain. Exactly. So I, I would argue that we don't want them to get more productive. When you said they should consolidate, I was having this heart palpitations. So, so who, <laughs> no, no, okay, let me defend. Um, so a well, lot of- I'm gonna be drinking Coors Light before no, you No, 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 I, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, the panel's unraveling. The panel's unraveling. Do we wanna change the uh, scene? No, the, there are a number of industries in order to be globally competitive, and they're going to have to, you're going to have to get some firms with scale. That's the bottom line. Some industries, you have to. Do you know what I think the biggest risk in Atl for Atlantic Canada is in the next 10 years? There's $2 trillion floating around the world in sort of looking to be invested. We all understand that public markets don't offer that anymore. They have gotten much better at scanning and evaluating risk in, in private hands. Something like 70% of the small, medium-sized businesses in Canada, and like maybe in Atlantic Canada, of course, are going to change hands, need to change hands in the next 10 years. I think the biggest risk we face is not one single thing will be owned in Atlantic Canada anymore. That's why, why we need that new generation of entrepreneurs. Exactly. Because we're seeing the insurance brokers are being taken over by national chains. We see funeral homes are being taken over, if you can believe it. Dentists, uh, dentists and autometrist uh, offices. So there is, that's already happening very quietly across mm -hmm. the region. These locally owned firms are now becoming part of nationally owned chains. But the question is, what's happening to that capital that's getting invested into those firms? It should be it's, turned into new investments in new industries. But in it's new not. It leaves town. So that's, uh, well, it's, so that's part of the public so, policy yeah. challenge is where's that next generation? Because you can't stop the capital flow. I, but I, mean, I think I you can you facilitate, you can make, the strange thing is, it, uh, certainly in small and medium-sized places, there is no money. That $2 trillion is, believe me, it's, it's not on Fogo Island. When somebody, on, and we just went through this, two businesses on Fogo Island need to transition. They've been in the same hands for 30 years. And the, the local people that are there, there are buyers who want to do it, who have the skills. You can't get money. I, although there's $2 trillion out there floating around. And so I think we need intermediaries like, like we play this role at Shorefast that help broker finding money, matching the entrepreneur to the money, because usually you, you just give up. It's the same with government programs. I mean, lots of energy and, and smart people working on program design. 90% of the people who could benefit from it either don't really understand it. I don't think it's entirely, maybe it's partially a communications problem about the programs, but I don't think so. I think there needs to be like impedance matching. You, you know, like in, in physics, one device emits at a certain wavelength and the other device receives only at a different one. And so what we do a lot in our work, and I think it needs to be in every community, is matching. Mm -hmm. And you know, the number of times when I came home, people would say, oh, the people in Newfoundland are all lazy, they don't really want to work. It's like, for the love of God, 
if you believe that, really, we should be running you out of town. You're just a problem. But I think that that is a, you know, the issue of um, aging owners of businesses and doing that matchmaking is one that we here in Nova Scotia have been talking about for a long period of time, really trying to figure out how do we, you know, how do we facilitate that matchmaking? Mm -hmm. How can we uh, find someone from here, someone new to here who wants to grow that business? Because exactly. the most heartbreaking thing is when you drive in a community like Matagan, which I did last year, and a very successful business is just closed because right. there was no one to take it. That's, that's even worse than it that's changing hands terrible. for someone in San Francisco. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, there's got to be more questions. Okay, there we go. Paul. So, I have a question. Actually, Ian Thompson wanted to ask it, but he's afraid to get but up, he's so afraid? I'll ask okay. it. <laughs> you, I knew that you would ask it, though, Paul. Uh, so, and you'll have to listen hard to find the question here. Um, so I, I, I take the, the productivity point in, in the brewery, the microbrew area, but I want to give a little different context and then you can, uh, what I'm basically asking is am I out to lunch or not? So uh, what I've seen happen in, in the brewery industry is we've had big breweries in places with low unemployment like Halifax or, or uh, La Salle, Quebec or whatever, and we basically redistributed that industry to create activity in rural areas. So all of these microbrews, yeah, they're a bunch downtown and they're a bunch downtown Toronto, but there's a whole bunch that feed the tourism industry and they create jobs in rural areas where I have nothing else. So what we've really done, in my view, is been innovative by creating products, and in some cases these products are actually exported outside of those communities. And uh, we've redistributed the jobs from a place that has 5% unemployment to places, and these are high value, high value jobs and a higher value product than I used to work for Labatt's and now it's owned by, I don't know who, Brazil or Belgium. Um, and uh, we've redistributed to a higher value product in an area which needs those jobs and they can use those and leverage those in a tourism business uh, or in a culinary business. So I, I see that's a different approach. I know it's lower productivity, but actually it's maybe higher economic value. Am I out to lunch? Am I, am I dreaming here? Is that a, no. Have we supported the wrong thing because we didn't out. consolidate next to my house in North End Halifax in the big brewery? Uh, no, I think, I don't want to It's good that you didn't say that he was out to lunch. I don't want to make this <laughs> all about beer, but, uh, and actually wages have gone down. So the, the microbreweries don't pay as much in salary, uh, and you pay more for the beer, and many governments actually get less revenue from the beer because they, they want to subsidize the beer. Having said all that, I think, again, if you were to literally poll uh, Nova Scotians and New Brunswickers, they'd say, we love that industry for the most part, and we're happy to pay the premium, and so on and so on, right? So, so I think that's a real good counterpoint to this idea that productivity is always about larger and larger uh, more, more capital, less people, and so on. But you still, you can't ignore other industries, and Pratt Whitney, for example, if it decided to, you know, atomize and become 50 little tiny Pratt Whitney's, it, it couldn't compete or couldn't survive. So it's industry by industry tourism, it's about high value, it's about experiences, it's about creating those, those moments and memories that people will pay for, and I, I love tourism, and I actually love rural Atlantic Canada, I think there's real opportunity but as I said before, I think we're going to need to infuse a whole new generation of entrepreneurs matched with good ideas, which, which is what you're I trying to do. I don't think there, there's not a shortage of ideas. I think that, that there is a, a mismatch between the ideas and, and the portals that they need to get born. So if there's a capital issue, then there I think is we, a need, capital we need issue. to step in. And if, yeah. if rural areas are at a disadvantage compared to urban centers, then there's a role for public policy and government. Yes to step in and fill that gap. So I hope that kind of answers uh, your question somewhat. Okay, I'm gonna go to Paul to see if you had anything to add in on this. Well, a, a few points. Just a part of our tourism strategy is to support uh, experiential tourism. So there's the, the, it's not just the, the pure competitiveness or productivity of the brewery, but the value that's added around the product. And there's obviously a, a burgeoning industry in, in this experiential tourism that we should be uh, keeping a focus on. But. Uh, with respect to small and medium-sized enterprises, the, the importance of collaboration is, is key. We're not going to succeed on a global stage unless we come together with SMEs bringing them together, lower some of the transaction costs that they face on things like upskilling, access to capital, and, and find some solutions that, that can um, uh, 
can be a, a, accustomed, I guess, to these uh, aggregations of businesses rather than just large firms. Great. Okay, I got one more question back here. This will be our, our last question, well, so it better be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to get Zita riled up a little bit here because I'm a website builder, so I'm really uh, <laughs> rolling up the sleeves here a little bit. No, but the funny part about it is um, we're currently undergoing a huge website project for a very traditional company, which I think a lot of people in this room are probably representative of. And one of the challenges that we're currently facing is representing a very strong Atlantic Canadian brand online for the global economy or even for the rest of Canada. And a lot of it is what I picked up on what you had mentioned about having an hour-long checkout. I think we probably have an hour-long checkout for an electrical distributor, and it's very tough to blend that interpersonal connection on websites or even on social media. So my question is more along the lines of blending. So I know you represented the, pers the stance of saying no to websites, but I'm wondering, is there a way to replicate the brand of Fogel Inn on a digital platform, are you investigating that avenue? And if you are, is there a way that we can lead as Atlantic Canadians to be able to say, hey, there's more than just an Amazon-esque experience. We have so much more to offer. Is there a blend of that? Actually, yeah. We do have a website. Have you, you should check out our website. <laughs> I, we, did, we hadn't met then, but we, I think we have a lovely and, and effective website. Uh, what, what I meant by the comment of taking down the website really just was, we're 29 rooms. My plan is we're $2,000 a night now in entry. It just needs to keep going up. And so we, you know, it's not a shortage of customers isn't the problem for, for that product. And we don't intend to build more rooms. I, I want to come back to your thing about presenting Atlantic Canada online. I think, the, and this is going to be very provocative, and you're trying to wrap up. It's okay, I think if you the, don't mind. The, the first thing we, it was a good one. Well, the first thing we have to do is figure out what the heck is Atlantic Canada? Uh, there, we agree. That <laughs> is a big problem. And anything that, you, I'm, I'm sure you're really good at what you do. Anything you put online, 99% of us are, are not going to recognize ourselves in it. Because I don't think, it, I, I think we need to have a big talk about what it means to be Atlantic Canadian other than sharing the same ocean that washes our shores. For four provinces that are located next to each other, other than whatever economic challenges we have, I don't think we have a, a really explored properly th the shared values. And, and because we've always seen the world as uh, a diminishing pie, we see it as a zero-sum game. So I'm defending my university and you're defending yours, and I'm defending my airport and you better not touch mine. I mean, this is the madness that we put so much energy into. And I think we have to come to terms with that before we build that website. Oh, oh, an existing brand. I thought you meant, can we? I think we could prop, yes, I do think we could choose some, some known brands in Atlantic Canada and get behind. And that is a very tough thing to do, but it just takes a bit of courage. The problem is that Nova Scotia actually steals New Brunswick's brand, right? So <laughs> you, you go to Boston or New York and you eat uh, Nova Scotia salmon, right? But it, it, you look at the export numbers and there's no, Salmon being exported from Nova Scotia, so I'll come from New Brunswick. So I think, I think uh, partly it's our friends in Nova Scotia here that are, are the problem. No, just oh, now the panel is really getting unruly. Okay, so what we're going to do, we are running out of time, but I think um, I'm going to let some folks have some last words. I think that Zita gave us a good question for the cocktail hour. What is our common values? What do we want collectively? Um, I've only lived in Atlantic Canada for six years, uh, but I have a home in PEI and a home in Nova Scotia. So I think that there's a sense of collectivity and connectivity. There's a strong roots and history here, and we do have uh, collective values. Uh, we work together collaboratively around the world, and I would say from my perspective, we're competing with the rest of the world, not with each other. So we have to figure this part out. So I'm going to come to each of you to have some closing remarks. Then we're going to work with everybody else to figure out our, our collective game plan together. Well, maybe just to reiterate that point, I mentioned the importance of, of SMEs coming together. But we just finished uh, a long exercise with six economic strategy table CEOs from across the country. They were really advocating the need to come together to, to pitch Canada to the world, that we can't do it as individual companies, as individual regions. We have to do it really more as a, as a country to have any impact 
on a, on a global scale. So the more we can do, find collaborative solutions and do things at a greater scale than we can do separately, I think we'll be better off for it. Karen Ann, that's got to be your perspective. Yes, definitely. Um, one thing I do want to mention that um, was, wasn't mentioned before, uh, it, it, the culture that we have in our plant that adopts technology, our little plant uh, that's 350 people um, was able to have the highest employee engagement score of any plant, and we have over 30,000 employees worldwide. So even, uh, I think that's important, and when we have visitors and we have our president coming, that is, um, it's very, very, it's our people that make our plant the way that the success of it. And I think we forget about that sometimes. Great. Zita, last word? I think we have to find a, a dynamically reconfigurable way to strengthen the specific and find that red thread that we can all hold on to so that man can build a website for us. Great. <laughs> David, one last thought? Uh, they, have, they haven't built an algorithm yet that can help a truck steer into the, to the snow or the ice, right? So I'm a little bit uh, skeptical of technology. I don't think we're going to see driverless vehicles and things as fast, at least in this region, or any cold climate as, as others. So I would just say, let's look at industry by industry. Let's be very specific. Uh, and maybe it's not a productivity issue, and maybe in some in industries uh, it is. Great. Well, now we're going to release all of you to allow you to have some cocktail hour. We're going to be back in here at 6.15 for the McKenna Awards and to celebrate our recipients tonight. Uh, but I think this was a good conversation at the Public Policy Forum. Our goal is to convene and have a conversation. We don't say the answers are easy. We don't ask easy questions. And, and we don't think the path is straight. But the value of the conversation is key. And uh, um, I'm pleased with the conversation that we just had. And I hope that you were too. So we'll see you at 6.15. <laughs>